Good morning, good morning, good morning all, and welcome to our webinar. My name is um, Trevor Townsend. I'm the head of the Department of um, Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. And today we would like to welcome you to our webinar. This is being hosted in conjunction with the Department of uh, Civil Engineering, UE Moda. And our today's webinar, we are focusing on BSM technology, sustainable pavement solutions for the Caribbean. And it's going to be a very interesting session today because it seeks to introduce bituminous stabilized materials, to introduce the technology to give some insight into the properties and behavior of BSM and to give some practical examples of usage. Today, we have a fantastic, very experienced and very knowledgeable panel. Um, we're going to very shortly hear from our first panelist, who is Engineer Joachim Kemp from the Wood Kemp Group. Um, we're also going to hear from Engineer Lawrence Bridgemoan, who is an experienced registered engineer specializing in pavements. Um, and then our key presenters are going to be Engineer Dave Collins from Woodgen, as well as Professor Kim Jenkins from AP Ludon. So that it, it's really going to be packed with information, some practical experience, some theoretical development, and it's really going to help us all to understand the application, the power of utilizing BSM in our roadway design and construction. Right, so that's all I'm going to say for now. Perhaps what I will do, I will hand over to my co-host, um, Dr. Leighton Ellis from UE Mona to give some opening remarks. Leighton? Morning, everyone. Um, welcome again. As you are fully aware, we are, the world is in a direction of sustainability and sustainable development. Um, from the UN standpoint, there are 17 sustainable development goals for which engineering finds its place and its part to play. At the university, we have been taking on this mantle as well. We have looked at research in regards to recycled aggregates. We have looked at other materials such as coconut fiber um, for increasing the tensile properties of concrete. We have looked at various materials and BSM or bitumen stabilized material is just an addition to that slew of options that we're providing as well. Now, as we know, this looks at generating the less waste as well as use of reuse of raw material or renewable raw material as well. And so this one promises to be a very exciting and interesting focus. And as we know, B B BSM as well is for sustainable road infrastructure at this point is where our particular emphasis will be on today. Now we're also looking at the whole idea of because there's so much information, we are fully aware that we're unable to do everything in one session. So the intent is that we would have multiple sessions going forward in the future. So sit back, relax, take notes, be, feel free to ask as many questions as you need to via the chat that is provided. And we'll be sure to take on these questions as we proceed throughout the session today. Over back to you again, Trevor. Thank you very much, Leighton. And um, with that, we move right into our first presentation from engineer Joachim Kemp. This engineer Kemp has over 30 years of experience in the areas of pavement um, and manufacture of materials for pavements. He is currently the sales director of Wurtgen, and he'll be talking to us initially about the technology and the manufacture of um, BSM. So that engineer Kemp, as soon as you're ready, you can unmute your mic and start your presentation. Okay, I hope every, everybody hears me and uh, we'll be on, on our way immediately. Okay. Good morning and a warm hello to everybody from my side. Uh, my name is uh, already introduced is Joachim Kemp. I'm the sales director for Latin America for Wittgen GmbH. And today I'm addressing you from uh, the far Chilean South. 
My thanks to the University of the West Indies for allowing me to contribute to this uh, webinar initiative and to all of you for your participation. It is my privilege to give the first presentation with the title Introduction to Bitumen Stabilized Materials, BSM. I want to set the stage for the presentations that follow and which will explain this technology in detail. Thus, beside, besides giving a general introduction to BSM, uh, I want to focus on issues and concepts which I think are fundamental to understand the benefits this technology offers. Worldwide roads and highways present generalized and in many cases premature damages. The world, uh, world uh, paved road network is now amounts now to 18 million kilometers, paved kilometers, and considering an effective service life of let's say 18 to 27 years for hot mix asphalt uh, structures and uh, 25 to 37 years for concrete pavements, the reconstruction of the complete network every two 20 or 20 uh, or 40 years is required or expressed differently uh, we will have to construct between half a million and a million of paved kilometers uh, paved road kilometers every year that is hardly a sustainable situation the environmental impact is another huge challenge for the worldwide road construction industry. The worldwide demand for drastic reductions of CO2 emissions inherent to many traditional road construction processes such as uh, the hot mix asphalt and, uh, and even concrete pavements directly collides with the need uh, uh, to reduce these, uh, these emissions. Uh, the same applies to the provision of granular materials yeah, by traditional means and that means digging big holes and messing up nature which is becoming increasingly unpopular and expensive also in road rehabilitation materials in existing pavements are still largely considered demolition waste or waste and they are deposited as, as such in non-environmentally friendly dumps. Now we face a new crisis uh, with, very, with a lot of new challenges, the COVID-19 coronavirus. And it's turning our world upside down and imposing us absolutely new realities as we can see on the right picture. In a few days, we change from this to this and to this. But COVID-19 has also showed us the need and importance of keeping up the supply chains. A functional and effective supply chain is fun fundamental for keeping uh, and maintaining the health systems uh, 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 to fight the pandemic, supply and feed the population, guarantee the supply and to all kinds of industries and business to reduce uh, the economic impact and facilitate the recovery process. But the new normal, uh, in the new normal, we will now see the importance first of the trucks and uh, the other new normal is that we will largely see uh, lots of highways as we've seen here without any cars and with lots of trucks, which imposes uh, some another few new challenges on road construction. The impact of uh, COVID-19 pandemic is still to be seen because we're still right in the middle of it, especially in Latin America. But it's coined new uh, concepts as social distancing, which changes the way we work, we purchase, we relate to each other, we travel. And it's also shown uh, and 
this webinar is an example of this, the importance of effective online connectivity. We will work, purchase things and relate with each other online. Basically everything that can be done uh, uh, will be done online. But uh, the economic recession we are facing, which is uh, the, the, the indirect impact uh, uh, of uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, is, uh, is yet to be seen. Yeah? There, there are uh, numbers of uh, contraction worldwide of 5.2% of the world GDP in the US. The economy is to be franked by almost 33%. Uh, that was between April and June to 2020, euro area uh, is, is, is planned to be shrinking by 12.1%. And there's a 10% GDP growth reduction expected in the Latin American area. And the Cambridge study estimates the coronavirus costs uh, in the next five years to amount up to 82 trillion US dollars. We can actually kind of feel for Miss Merkel here and see what she's thinking. It is a mess and it's going to be expensive. But let's get back to the challenges of the world infrastructure and to better understand these, but also to understand the opportunities offered by new technologies such as the BSMs. Let us take a brief look at pavement structures used nowadays. On the left, we see a typical multi-layered pavement structure with a riding course, which is here. Uh, I will change this to a pointer, a laser pointer, which is here under number five. While this could be a pavement anywhere in the world today, it is actually a cut of a Roman road built 2,000 years ago. And if we look at the modern pavements here on the right side, uh, not much has changed since Roman times. Uh, besides granular based materials, there's uh, basically two new types of pavements that have been developed in the last, let's say, 100 years, uh, specific in the last 50 years. And that is hot mix asphalt in different flavors. We have concrete roads and we have a mix of both. Yeah concrete on, on, on hot mix asphalt or the other way around, asphalt on concrete. And one of the main characteristics on which is the main characteristic these pavements have in common, and that is that all of these are continuously bound. And here is, uh, appears uh, surfaces the question, what is the mode of failure? And the mode of failure of uh, all these pavements is fatigue. So let's look a little bit more of what fatigue means. This is the Morandi Bridge in Genoa in July 2018, designed by Ricardo Morandi, built between 1963 and 1967. The bridge had been subject to controversies and continual restoration work starting as soon as the 1970s. In April 2018, in face of uh, the advanced state of deterioration, the bridge operator, the company Autostrade, determined that urgent action was required and bidded its reconstruction, which was scheduled to start in the fall of 2018. On August 14th, 2018, a couple of days after the previous picture was taken, at 11.36 local time, a 210 meter section of the Morandi Bridge collapsed catastrophically, killing 43 people. This picture dramatically shows one on the, of the main underlying challenges of the world road networks and the uh, world road construction industry. Because when structures designed to fail by fatigue reach their design life, they risk a catastrophic failure, which is an accelerated and total failure from there is no recovery, where no recovery is possible. 
making it necessary to replace this structure, hopefully before the catastrophic failure has happened. Today we have 11, 18 million kilometers of paved road designed to fail by fatigue, many of which have already exceeded their design life. In presentations previous to July 8, uh, 2018, I used this picture of the Interstate I-35 bridge in Minneapolis, US, uh, United States, which uh, catastrophically collapsed on August 1st, 2007. While here we're talking about bridges, which by the way are part of the road infrastructure, the problem also applies to pavement structures. These only apparently collapse less dramatically. Sadly, in several opportunities, I witnessed fatal traffic accidents triggered by a catastrophic collapse of the existing pavement. After these tragedies, Routinely, experts around the world warn that they will repeat them unless fundamental changes are made to the design, construction, and maintenance of road infrastructures. Unfortunately, reality shows that these warnings largely remain as a fool's errand. Only in Italy, before the collapse of the Morandi Bridge, between 2016 and 2017, five other bridges collapsed. Thus, after some in, uh, initial turmoil and activity, it is business as usual, as uh, this new picture of a bridge in Aula, Tuscany, Italy confirms, which catastrophically collapsed on April 8th, 2020. That is a couple of, not even two months ago. Complementing the concepts of continuously bound materials and uh, the fatigue failure, let us now look at modular ratios. When designing pavement structures, modular ratios allow us to better understand their performance over time and in many cases explain or avoid the cause for or of premature, uh, premature uh, uh, failures. The objective of a multi-layer pavement structure is to effectively distribute the traffic loads to the subgrade, which is a support condition given by us by Mother Nature. That's the subgrade here is the, the load and the stress distribution. For pavement structure designs, and an important mechanical material property is the resilient modulus, which is an indicator of the rigidity of the layers. The modular ratio is a relation of the modulus of the layer, uh, uh, of one layer and the layer immediately inferior to this layer. So we have a, 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 a ratio of two here, and this means that uh, the multiplication is uh, 100 by two is 200. So that is, uh, that is how the modular ratio works. It's applied, as shown here, starting from the given support, yeah, the given support by uh, Mother Nature, which is the subgrade. The objective is to design and build uh, balanced pavements, structures that distribute the stresses of the traffic loads to the interface between the subgrade and the pavement structure, avoiding the deformation of the subgrade. This is an imbalance. This is a balanced, imbalanced pavement. Yeah, we have a, a, a effective st stress distribution in this interface. In this slide, I want to introduce the concepts of maximum and effective modules. While layers of different materials have specific moduli, like shown here as maximum stiffness. What determines the performance of a pavement structure are the effective moduli, which are here shown as effective stiffness. This area. The modular ratio reflects the dependency between the modulus of a specific layer and the, and the modulus of the underlying layer, in fact, of all underlying layers. 
Thus, a weak supporting layer affects the moduli of the overlying layers, especially, uh, especially variations of the subcrate modulus can affect the moduli of the whole pavement structure as shown here. You see here the, the, the moduli of the subgrades in this example is halved is from 100 to 50, and we can see the impact it has on the effective uh, stiffness or the infect, uh, effective modulus of each of these layers. What happens when a pavement does not comply with the modular ratio rule? In this example, we have a hot mix asphalt layer with a maximum modulus of 4000 megapascal and a modular ratio of 3 to 5. The hot mix asphalt layer rests on a base layer with a modulus of 400 megapascal, violating the modular ratio rule with a ratio of 10 instead of the allowed three to five. You see, this is, uh, if I take the relationship, this is 10 times more, and it is not by any means three to five times more. The result is an unbalanced structure, which subject to traffic loads, would suffer an accelerated deterioration until the modular ratio is met. Here we have four, so here we meet the modular ratio. Now we have a balanced pavement, but a destroyed pavement. Nature seeks equilibrium and not complying with the natural law of modular ratios when designing pavement structure has dire consequences. Making now the link to the BSMs, uh, the modular ratio of the bitumen stabilized materials as shown here is similar to continuous bound layers such as CTBs, for example, and hot mix asphalts. Let us now look at some of the general concepts of the BSM technology, which will, will be addressed in detail by the presentations that follow. What are BSMs? What they are, they are granular materials treated, stabilized, with bitumen foam and, uh, or, uh, or bitumen emulsion, BSM foam or BSM emulsion. What they are not is hot mix asphalt. And nothing that applies to hot mix asphalt, no tests, nothing applies to them. The foam required for foam bitumens consists of foam of, of bitumen bubbles filled with steam and the foam quality depends on the bitumen type, temperatures, bitumen pressure, dispersion of the water for the foaming process. To produce a foam bitumen, 98 parts of uh, bitumen at 175 degrees Celsius I injected with a pressure of three bars into an expansion ch chamber together with two parts of water and some air for better dispersion. The explosive change of state of the water from liquid to gaseous with a volume expansion by a factor of 1,500 ejects foam bitumen bubbles from the expansion, uh, expansion chamber at uh, plus minus 100 degrees Celsius. The bitumen foam bubble produced uh, in the process we've seen on the previous slide now collides with the large aggregate. This is, is, is cold and let's say at ambient temperature uh, uh, um, aggregates and explodes into millions of uh, bitumen micro droplets which interact with the fine fraction of the mix, which is uh, the material uh, mesh uh, under, under the mesh 200 uh, minus 0 0.075 millimeters. Once the material treated with uh, foam bitumen is densified, the bitumen droplets form a discontinuous viscoelastic spot welds 
uh, millions uh, matrix of uh, with millions of viscoelastic spot wells as shown on the left picture uh, without coated uh, coarse particles we've seen there's no coating here of the coarse particles the foam bitumen mixes uh, um, uh, in foam bitumen mixes the bitumen even at high percentages the 3.5 we could actually increase this to four and five seems to vanish as shown in the picture on the right. The objective of the BSM mixes is not the involvement of the coarse partic particles, but the homogeneous distribution of the bitumen droplets in the mix. As construction materials, the compacted BSMs offer excellent bearing capacity and stress performance. What is the effect of stabilizing granular material with foam bitumen? Let us take a graded crushed stone with a cohesion of 30 to 55 kilopascal and an internal friction angle of 30, uh, 43 to 51 uh, degrees. And uh, add to this 2.2% of bitumen in, in the form of uh, foam plus 0.7% uh, of cement as, uh, as a filler. And we maintain the density, same density in moisture content. And now, while we still maintain the friction angle uh, rather unchanged, which uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a show for the granular characteristic of the material, we see that the, um, that the, that the cohesion has almost tenfolded uh, 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 has almost a tenfold increase uh, uh, after this process. So translated to the column war graph, the effect of the stabilization with the bitumen foam on a granular material is the displacement of the failure envelope. For the design of the pavement structures, the same principle are applied as to granular materials, yeah, such as the analysis of stress states and uh, the uh, mode of failure by permanent deformation. With a simple monotonic triaxial test, um, the deviator stress ratio, which is defined as the ratio of the applied deviator stress to the failure devi deviator stress expressed as a percentage, is calculated and then fed into a design software, for example, Rubicon. And uh, um, via a transfer function, which also takes into account uh, design life criteria, such as the permanent deformation and uh, the rut depth and reliability. Here we see a picture of uh, an example of the condition of a road at failure at the end of the pavement design life with a rut of 10 millimeter uh, in the uh, outer uh, uh, loaded uh, wheel path. If we look at the structural analysis, which is important to 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 understand the, the advantage this, this type of technology offers. Um, continuous bound material pavements like hot mix asphalt are subject to stresses and fatigues, uh, tensile stresses and fatigue cracking. Yeah. While uh, in BSM structures, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, we, the traffic induces stress states and permanent deformation, as already said. The important difference is that at the end of the design line, the continuously bound structures is destroyed and must be replaced, while the con discontinuously bound BSM structure is permanent permanently deformed and thus denser and does not need to be replaced. The latter is especially important uh, when comparing life cycle costs for rehabilitation options as shown in this slide. 
Yeah, this example, the objective of this example is to compare orders of magnitude of life cycle costs and energy consumption of the shown alternatives. The pavement to the left needs rehabilitation with the target service life of 30 million equivalent axles. Four options are evaluated. Mill and replace, which is here the first option. Uh, patching includes patching and asphalt surfacing, reconstruction, full replacement, stabilize uh, and uh, uh, full replacement, and the South African inverted pavement, which is uh, the stabilization of the affected area uh, and uh, uh, converting it into a CTB and cover this CTB with a high quality granular base and some asphalt surfacing as well. And last but not least, the uh, stabilized the BSM alternative, stabilize uh, the existing structure uh, with uh, foam bitumen and cover it with an UTFC, which is an ultra thin friction course. And all these alternatives have the same target service life of 30 million equivalent axles. Um, now we can see, and as I said, these are only uh, orders of magnitude, just to, to make the point. Um, and the upper percentage indicates the cost increase of each option relative to the BSM alternative, and the lower percentage, the savings reduction, when comparing the BSM alternative to each other options. Um, this would mean that in this case, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the overlay is 88% more expensive than BSM, or the other way around. If you look at an overlay and you look then at BSM, you would save 47%. So these are the two, and the same applies here to the energy consumption. While these are orders of magnitude, they give an idea of the benefits, of the potential benefits of, of, of the BSM technology. Let's wrap up with uh, some conclusions. Designing, building and maintaining continuously bound uh, pavement structures subject to fatigue failures has important economic, functional and environmental downsides. Which much of the worldwide road network in dire condition and in need of rehabilitation, the necessity to consider alternative, alternatives to continuous bound structures subject to fatigue is critical. COVID-19 will have an impact on road construction. Last not least, on the budgets forcing many countries to look for more economic alternatives without sacrificing quality. Bitumen stabilized materials allow the design and construction of thick homogeneous layers with excellent load bearing capacity and considerable economic and environmental advantages. While continuously bound structures need replacement after reaching their design life, BSM, uh, BSM structures can be re or utilized continuously with minimum interventions. The BSM technology is a proven technology successfully applied worldwide in thousands of built kilometers. And as a matter of fact, as we will see in a presentation that will follow, also in your areas in Trinidad. But as any technology, it is a technology in development and the experiences from the field and continuous research allow us to better understand it and to optimize its application. Thank you very much for your attention. Stay safe and stay healthy. All right, thank you very much for that presentation. It was a very insightful one. Um, can, can you hear me clearly? Yes, hello. Okay, good. So we have a few questions and a few minutes for a few questions. One of the questions that came forward was from one of our participants by the name of Shire. And the question is, what is the detriment when the modular ratio is below the lower limit? For example, the hot mix, hot mix asphalt it has a value of two or, or less. What is the detriment when the modular ratio is below the lower limit? Well, it's, it's, not, it's not kind of um, 
that there is a, there's a lower limit. The, the, the point of the modular ratios is, uh, as, I, as I explained, is that there is a direct uh, relation between um, the basis of any foundation of the foundation of any pavement, which is the subgrade, and uh, the mechanical properties of the materials we use in the layers, which determine the stiffness of that layer. So um, that means that each layer can achieve a certain maximum uh, stiffness or modulus, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it, it, it is dependent on what it is built, about, uh, it's built on. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, um, the professor is, is a little, maybe can be a little bit more, uh, give a little bit more uh, detailed explanation. But modulus, uh, the modulus is not a, it's, it's not a fixed value. Yeah? Moduli change uh, with the conditions. And this means that if I have a, sometimes like a, a subgrade, as I showed in the example with a 100 MP, uh, megapascal modulus, and it starts raining, uh, and then suddenly the 100 megapascal uh, become 50 megapascal. Um, being the, 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 the objective or, uh, and the importance of the modu uh, modu modulus ratio, that this affects all layers that are actually overlying. And um, uh, the, the big uh, challenge here is that we keep on designing roads uh, kind of, we have a project for 150 kilometers, and uh, what's your design? Yeah, it's the same design for all 150 kilometers. And, and, and that does not make sense, because it's impossible that you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the same conditions, the same support conditions for 150 kilometers. And uh, uh, if you vi violate, as I, as I, sh I tried to show, if you don't take this into account, you can, uh, you can get into a lot of trouble because uh, even if you put a, a very stiff material like concrete or, or asphalt on top of a, a very soft, or let's say a very, very, not very uh, sound layer, it will break very quickly. Yeah. Um, another question that's coming forward from Prakash is, is BSM pavement superior to the hot mix asphalt pavements in trop tropical climates, such as the Caribbean, as we experience? Um, this is a good question. First of all, we're not having here, uh, we're not fighting against hot mix asphalt. Let, 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 let us make that clear, yeah? Uh, and especially from, from uh, also from, from Wirtgen, let's do some, some advertising here too for the company. I mean, we also sell asphalt pavers, we sell asphalt plants, so we're not an enemy of the asphalt industry and of hot mix asphalts, yeah? We just uh, um, want uh, uh, to understand that we can uh, use both technologies, uh, if we use both technologies wisely, we get the best of the deals. And um, uh, in the beauty of, uh, let's say, the big advantage of BSMs is that they are base layers and uh, they, they are not, they are, the, the, the advantage of, the, the additional advantage is, uh, say, that um, the dispersion of the bitumen droplets, as I said, the fines in the mix, gives them uh, an additional plus. It, it captures the fines. So um, in tropical climates uh, where we have a lot of rain and rain is always, uh, water is always a big issue with, uh, with road uh, structures. Um, even under saturated conditions, we have observed that uh, uh, BSM layers have uh, actually performed uh, uh, surprisingly well, even if they're not surfaced. But um, uh, also to finish uh, this question, there is not a direct uh, uh, relation between, let's say, hot mix asphalt and, uh, and BSMs. BSMs are base layers. Uh, they are kind of between base layers and what hot mix asphalt sometimes also used as base layers, that we took a, a black base. But uh, um, as I said at the beginning, uh, to use both technologies wisely will be the best of the solutions. All right. Yeah, that's really done. We, we can have those questions there. Um, there are going to be an opportunity for further questions um, at the end of the Q&A.
and, and no doubt the other presentations may in fact answer some of those questions, but um, we will return to them um, as, we, as we get into our general Q&A. But I want to move on now to our, thanks very much, Engineer Joachim Kim. I want to move on to our next presenter, who is um, Engineer Lawrence Bridgemohan. Engineer Bridgemohan is currently a PhD student um, in civil engineering at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine. His specialty of his research specialty is the field of bitumen st stabilized material. He is a registered engineer, registered, registered specialist engineer with the Board of Engineering of Trinidad and Tobago uh, in the field of road asphalt, roads and asphalt. And he is um, the holder of a BSc degree in civil engineering and a master's MSc in construction management. And, very actively engaged in research, design, and construction applications of stabilized materials. So over to you, Engineer Lawrence Bridgemohan. You can um, unmute your mic and um, start your presentation by sharing your screen. Thank you, Dr. Townsend. Um, my name is Lawrence Bijman, and I'll be presenting to you today on the topic of foam bitumen stabilized materials for pavement engineering applications in, in the region. Um, just a bit of background of the foam bitumen stabilization technology. It has been utilized <clears throat> within the region for over a decade based on um, initiative through a combined effort of the contractor, Mr. Danny Gokul and Danny's Enterprises, the late um, senior lecturer at the University of West Indies, Mr. Raymond Charles, engineer, Mr. Cecil Chin, in collaboration with efforts from Mr. Mike Marshall, engineer Mike Marshall of the Wichern Group, and Lauder International, Mr. Dave Collins. Um, further to these, um, I have actually played uh, a role throughout the development of this technology, um, with Mr. Professor Jenkins actually added to the team as well now. I am actually pursuing PhD research at the University of West Indies now in this field. So as the world um, adjusts to what has become and examines the new normal, there's a greater emphasis now on addressing concerns and adopting to what has been to a better normal. In light of these developments, the road building and rehabilitation industry is demanded and currently required to embrace innovation, sustainability, and provide more economically advantageous pavement engineering solutions to the industry. When we examine the design principles of pavement engineering practice. We recognize that pavement structures need to be adequately designed and constructed to dissipate imposed vehicle loading to an acceptable level at the subgrade support level. As such, the pavement design and construction consideration should also involve um, the a consideration that at the upper layers within the pavement structures, there is an increased stresses upon these aggregate and asphalt mixed layers. In light of these, the aggregate skeleton within these upper pavement layers are required to impose a lot of these stresses and strains. Currently, there's an increase in demand for pavement aggregates for infrastructural development. A company's demand locally in Trinidad and Tobago and across the region uh, concerns of depleting supplies, environmental degradation, and for the op options of importation, reduce foreign exchange for considering this option. As such, there's a renewed emphasis globally for sustainable practices and its employment in pavement engineering solutions. Fortunately, the foam bitumen stabilization technology allows for the enhancement of available materials in the construction of durable pavement systems for allowing an increased repetitive load carrying capacity, providing an effective cost, cost effective solutions to the Caribbean. 
Formic urine is produced when hot bituin comes in contact with cool water in the presence of pressurizing. What it results is a reduced state of temporary, a temporary reduced state of bituin of reduced bituin viscosity. This allows for the coating of the finer particles within the mix. The resultant BSM is characteristic of an uncoated granular coarse aggregate with a foam bituin filler mastic at the contact points between the coarse particles. As we can, if you look at the microscopical, we will see that these foam bitumen fine filler mastic is not continuous, not drawing, and as such, foam bitumen and bitumen stabilized materials that result are referred to as non continuously bound materials. As such, they maintain their granular interlock, similar to uh, granular aggregates, but has an increased cohesion and, as a result, increased shear strength providing for increased layer carrying capacity. The foam bitumen stabilization technology was introduced in Trinidad and Tobago in the year 2006 as an attractive pavement solution for the rehabilitation of some of the heavily trafficked pavement systems. It's allowed, it was initially introduced as the coal in place recycling technique and with the evolution of technology, the coal in plant recycling technique has been introduced as an alternative and sustainable payment option. As previously identified, the coal in place recycling technique was considered as an attractive solution for the in place rehabilitation of existing pavements with economic and environmental benefits promoting its use. With the introduction and improvement technology, the introduction of the coal and plant recycling technique promises to play a pivotal role in addressing the concerns of equipment of material suitability and availability for pavement systems. The coal and plant recycling technology allows the control blending of available quarry aggregates as well as reclaimed pavement materials. It allows for paver laid applications, which promotes economic and environmental benefits to the industry. Much of the success for involving applications locally have been a result of mixed design formulations and structural design procedures, which have been implemented with best construction practices. <clears throat> Sorry. Are they um, involved in this um, design formation processes? A recipe-based mixed design procedure has been um, con uh, <coughs> Sorry, a recipe-based mixed design procedure has been followed. This has been in, in guide, with guidelines identified by the Wojan Co Recycling Manual and the TG2 World of South Africa. These involve determination of parent aggregate sampling characteristics, aggregate blending, foam bitumen optimal determination, and active fill and selection, as well as stabilized material strength testing and classification for input into structural design procedures. These um, mixed design formulation processes are in fact carried out in a BSM stabilized design, stabilization design laboratory, which are equipped with specialist laboratory equipment to simulate the conditions, the foaming conditions, the mixing conditions, and the compaction conditions that are expected with field applications. Arising from some of the research that has been carried out in this um, full BSM lab, this particular slide aims to highlight um, investigations into determining the effectiveness of uh, treating some of the locally sourced northern range uh, crushed blue limestone aggregates and the effectiveness of this in producing a foam bitumen stabilized base material. As can be seen from the slide, the treatment with foam bitumen has allowed for an increase in cohesion by up to four times with a slight reduction in friction angle. What this means is that the material is now considered to be a BSM-1 classified material with increased cohesion and ultimate shear strength to reduce permanent strain accumulation. This uh, research has actually been developed and now considering for 
applications with some of the one of the um, state foreign agencies within the nation and um, it has been the basis for data and use in some of the application construction applications that which we identified further. In addition to the mixed design formulation process, the structural design procedures that are implemented with the application of the technology require the donation of subgrade and pavement layer supports. As such, within our design and um, applications, we actually carry out site investigation. These are some of the pieces of equipment and some of the procedures that we usually use in order to determine adequate structural design. These include test pit analysis, DCP analysis, and ground penetrating radar analysis. So this slide aims to highlight the a typical structural comparison when a BSM treated crushed stone layer is substituted for a crushed stone layer of equivalent thickness on similar supports. As can be seen from this typical structural comparison, the substitution of a 200 mm uh, BSM-1 crushed stone layer results in a tripling of the carrying capacity when compared to that of the conventional area structure. This allows for an extended design life due to the use of the material. Similarly, when we consider a granular based conventional flexible pavement structure of a carrying capacity of 11.5 standard axles, million standard axles, and the introduction of a BSM 200 thick BSM equivalent thickness um, treated layer, we actually recognize that owing to the increased carrying capacity of the BSM layer, the pavement structure has an overall equivalent carrying capacity, which allows for the removal of a base layer in this particular pavement structure. This has resulted and can contribute to material cost savings for up to 10, up to 20%. So the KMA implant stabilization technology method allows for a construction technique which promotes controlled processing and improved consistency for quality aggregates. It allows for improved rate control during paver laid applications. It allows for improved installation production rates through the use of the acid paver. In addition, the use of an acid paver with tamping a vibratory screen allows for additional compactive effort from the paver screens. This allows for a reduction in aggregate breakdown during loading. And there are logistical advantages with stockpiling capability of implant materials. In addition to paver in applications of the implant stabilized materials, the material can also be um, installed using conventional construction equipment, as can be identified in some of these photos. In this particular um, example, this is actually a job application utilizing the implant uh, stabilization technology. Um, in this particular example, an alternative pavement design was proposed to the client, which exceeded the initial carrying capacity of the original design. Major highlights of the alternative design was the use and replacement of the granular base, sub-base, and the granular base layers. This was replaced by uh, sub uh, implant cement stabilized sub-base and a BSM stabilized treated crushed stone base. Major features of the design allowed for the use of a thinner HML layer reducing from 75 mm to 50 mm. It allowed for a thinner structural base, a slight thickening of the sub-base, but the largest uh, cost-effective measure was the elimination of this base layer jurgen, as the stabilized base layer was able to produce and, carry, and allow for increased carrying capacity. Essentially, the design allowed for a stiffer CSM sub-base support with a high strength bitumen stabilized base. This allowed for an economical, durable, balanced payment structure. When we look at uh, some 
aspects of the face construction. Um, the sand capping layer was installed using the conventional means. The implant cement stabilized layers were installed using an asphalt paver, which allowed for increased um, efficiency and production of a uh, layer with increased um, grade and slope controls. Similarly, the same was done using the bitumen stabilized base layer. And finally, an installation of the reduced thickness HMA surface layer. This uh, slide aims to uh, highlight the installation of the BSM layer and a close knit finish upon completion. And the installation of an asphaltic concrete reduced thickness layer. Currently, these pavements are in service and are being monitored to determine its performance with time. So, in addition to in plant stabilization of granular aggregates. This slide aims to highlight a job application involving the reclamation and reuse of existing pavement materials. In this particular um, application, the scope involves the coal milling of an existing asphalt layer. On one of the nation's um, major highways leading to South Trader, it's allowed for the in-situ lime cement stabilization of the lower layers and identifying areas. In essence, the material that was milled was carried to the plants while the in-place cement stabilization was to carry out. The materials were treated in plants and brought back to sites within the same time window and installed allowing for the installation of an in-plant BSM-1 wrap uh, stabilized layer. The photo actually shows um, traffic that was allowed on the, um, the BSM stabilized layer for about three or four days before the actual servicing was carried out. Um, this video aims to highlight traffic that was allowed and allowed to carry about and travel effectively without any convenience on the layer. In addition to the um, pavement applications that have been carried out um, as identified previously. This slide aims to highlight an actual industrial commercial application that was proposed for a private client involving the pipe, um, pipe storage and laid down area services. In this um, application, the plant was actually brought to site and the materials that were all then were actually stabilized and also um, laid using the paver providing a surface that is currently being utilized on seal and to the satisfaction of the clients. Um, currently, these pavements are being monitored as they have been in service and the field monitoring is actually being done in conjunction with the UE St. Augustine Department of Civil Engineering. In concluding, just like to um, summarize that the KMA implant stabilization methodology allows for the enhancement of available aggregate materials. It eliminates the need for diverging aggregates. It allows for controlled processing of materials of monitored qualities towards economical and durable construction. It allows for pavement layers of improved structural capacity with a rehab, reduced rehabilitation costs at the end of design. Essentially, it allows potential and has potential for sustainable applications within the region. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Engineer Bijuan, for the presentation and highlighting the local use of BSM. Um, two questions. Um, first question: What is the what are the typical performance testing done locally for BSM? Okay, um, so if we were to consider BSMs as uh, enhanced granular aggregates, um, one of the major requirements for its classification is the term of its strength, shear strength characteristics. As such, um, the multi triaxial is one of the, um, the multi triaxial testing is one of the testing which allows it to determine the shear parameters of the material which are used for classification and also used for input into the structural design procedures. All right. Um, one more question. 
in doing a BSM design, how important is it to achieve the optimum gradation for foaming? That's actually an excellent question because that actually is one of the most significant um, um, considerations of the parent material characteristics that has to be identified um, before consideration because um, the material needs to have a sufficient amount of number passing number 200 to allow the creation of the massic. And ideally, there is a, um, a recommended gradient band to allow a densely compacted mix. So um, to go further on that question, um, it, is, it is important and in some cases, blending of the aggregate may be necessary to allow a suitability for foaming and effective foaming. All right, thank you. We have more questions, but we'll deal with these questions in the Q&A session. So Dr. Okay. Tanzan. Thank you very much, um, Engineer Lars Bejohan. Okay. And um, just a reminder to everyone that you can post your comments and questions on the chat. So that um, those of you who are familiar with how the Zoom chat feature used is worked, you can indicate so on the chat. And we will be having a, a question and answer period after the next um, presentations. Um, so that you are gonna have a chance to get those questions answered. And if there are other questions, even at the end, we'll be able to collect those questions and get those answers to you. So please uh, remember to post your questions as we go along on the chat, and um, we will try to get those questions answered. Thanks a lot, Engineer Lawrence, again. So I want to move on to our next presenters, and they are doing a tandem presentation. And we'll start with Engineer Dave Collins, um, and then we go to uh, Professor Kim Jenkins, who will be doing the, the significant presentation on the, um, the theory and the technology. Um, but let me start with engineer Dave Collins, because he is a professional civil engineer in South Africa, but he has worked in the road construction industry um, for over 50 years, for over 50 years. And he has worked in many countries, including in Brazil, where he was responsible for laying down some recycled truck lanes on the Achan Senna Highway that links the cities of Sao Paulo to Rio de Janeiro. And that was done whilst the highway was carrying thousands of trucks per day. Um, he may get a chance to tell us um, how brave that would have been. He said that that's why he got his gray hair, his first night on the job. But um, tremendous knowledge and experience in both contracting and design and in road rehabilitation in particular. So um, welcoming now to unmute his mic and um, I see his videos up already and start to share his screen engineer Dave Collins, and he'll be followed directly by Professor Jenkins. So here's Dave. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, good morning, everyone. Um, the sun setting, I'm just watching the sun setting here, so I'm gonna be drinking beer a lot sooner than most of you, which is great. What I want to share with you this afternoon is the bones of a mixed design. And I want to start by saying that those who come from an asphalt background might find it difficult to grasp this because when you design an asphalt mix, you actually are looking for an end result. So you tailor your mix to give you what you want. The BSMs are totally different. You start with an aggregate and you see what you can get out of that aggregate by adding bitumen and some active filler. So it's a, it's a completely different approach to a mixed design. And you know, wherever I go in the world, I meet people who just don't understand, they don't get it. And, and I've, I've, I've seen this as a, um, it's like a country like the West Indies, they love cricket. We love cricket too. Okay, so let's say that we all play cricket and that's what we do from the time we can walk. We learn to play cricket and we play cricket and we're isolated from the rest of the world because that's all we want to know. And then along comes a guy who speaks funny and he says, oh, you guys want to play baseball. And you tell him to get the hell out of there because you play cricket. So it's a little bit like that. If you were brought up with one thing in your mind, it's very, it, you, you, you've got to adjust. You've got to do a lot of adjusting to change. 
And that's, I think, one of the reasons why we are having a few problems with uh, getting BSMs established as the preferred technology in the world. It's a lack of understanding. Anyway, let's move on. What is a mixed design? Well, it answers the following key questions. Is the material that you're trying to stabilize, is it suitable for uh, treating with foam, with foam bitumen? The next one is how much bitumen do you need to put in there to get it stabilized? Do you need an active filler? And if so, which active filler? And then finally, what are the properties? What are you actually achieving by stabilizing this material? So that's why we do a mix design. Dave, you no. haven't shared your screen. I don't think you've shared your screen. Oh, what do I have to do here? Um, Click on the green uh, share screen. Oh, my word. Down at the okay. bottom. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Sit down there. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Are we there? Yes. Okay, right, let's carry on. 50% of the cost of treating a material with uh, foam bitumen active filler is in the materials. So, in, in fact, it's more than 50%. It's generally up in the 60s or 70s. If you just look at the layer of the bitumen stabilized material, you can, depends where you are and how far you're hauling your bitumen and what the oil companies did to the bitumen price but you can be up in the 70% of the cost of doing the work. So it's really important to get uh, to uh, optimize the amount of bitumen and active filler you use. Okay, and the question I, I often get asked is, but why do we need to do more than one mix design? I mean, this material is pretty similar to what we, we, we treated in the last job. Well, just remember that no two materials are the same. I mean, Jochen mentioned that in his initial uh, presentation. He said that if you've got a road 150 kilometers long, yes, the subgrade's not going to be the same. But if you're looking at recycling, one thing's for certain, you are going to encounter, encounter different materials in the uh, material that you recycle. So that's why you do a mix design, to make sure you can actually get what you want out of it. And you want to minimize your cost. Again, it's back to the cost. And finally, when you do a mix design, you're actually getting the proper information you need to design the pavement. You're getting the shear properties of the material. You need that in order to get an effective design. And that's where the confidence comes from. So that's what the mix design is all about. Let me give you some background. Where, do we, where are we coming from? Um, 1993, we started uh, playing with foam bitumen. We imported a bucket of bolts from Canada. It didn't work very well but we made it work and uh, we found that this is amazing stuff. It really is. But the, the equipment didn't work very well. So we went and had a chat with our friends from Germany, the, the, uh, the Wirtgen organization and said, guys, there's a technology here that needs a bit of engineering. Unfortunately, they took it on board and they designed out all the problems. And uh, 1995, Along came the 2500 in situ recycler. We got the prototype spray bar, foam bitumen spray bar in South Africa, and off we went. And we've never looked back. But the point I want to make here is that technology in those days, we didn't know what we were dealing with. We were dealing with something that's pretty good. We knew that. We knew it was good. But uh, how do we design for this? And everybody was just using Marshall stability and it made sense because, you know, I mean, you are adding bitumen to the material, so it must be like an asphalt. So that's what we did. And well, it worked. Then in 1998, we wrote a manual and we have this uh, technology partnership with Vertkin where um, we look after the software, they look after the hardware. And in 1998, we said, look guys, Marshall's not right. Let's uh, rather use an ITS because that gives us a, a better handle on the material. Um, and that's how we're going to design. We're going to use ITS. So off we went and we designed with ITSs and everybody is happy. And our industry in South Africa started using the, the technology. And we came up with the first Bible for BSM in 2002, published by the Asphalt uh, Academy in South Africa. But again, that was looking at ITS. And uh, 
and that's what we did. Uh, and we, we built a lot of roads on that, but they didn't all work. And uh, it was only later that a gentleman who used to work for the Loudoun organization, um, he went off to become very clever. Uh, Professor Jenkins came back to South Africa with his PhD, and he had studied uh, bitumen stabilization for his PhD. And he came back and he said, guys, you got it all wrong. And fortunately, people listened. And then we got TG2 rewrite in 2009. And what we embodied in that uh, publication was, it's not ITS that's going to give you all the answers. You need to be doing triaxial testing because you need to be looking at the shear properties of the material. So that was the biggest change in how we approached BSMs, which was fabulous. Okay, so everybody went away very happy. We said, okay, guys, we're going to do triaxial. And then we looked at our commercial laboratories and we said, guys, let's do triaxial testing. And everybody looked at us and said, are you crazy? We don't do those tests. And, and nobody was very excited. So what we did in 2010, we got a crowd of people together and said, we're going to do this properly. And we got the buy-in from contractors, from uh, commercial laboratories, from consulting engineers. And we floated this company, BSM Laboratories, um, a commercial laboratory. And it's owned by, uh, I'd say, half of South Africa because we spread the shareholding far and wide, as far as, wi as far and as wide as we could in order to get people to buy into this technology and to participate, not to compete. And that proved to be the, the key to success. But we started with the vaguest of ideas. Uh, we had the, the foaming units from Vertgen, um, which are pretty expensive, but that's the investment. That's what you have to do in the beginning. And then we took uh, Kim Jenkins's uh, PhD thesis, and fortunately, he, he uh, helped us a lot. And we started with vibrating hammers, because this was the key to making nice specimens that, uh, that were pretty similar. So we made these vibrating hammer frames and we got going and then we had to, we had to do triaxial testing, monotonic triaxial testing. So Kim had done all sorts of uh, work in Stellenbosch and we, we, we participated there, but this was all uphill. The whole way it was uphill. But thankfully, thankfully, the cooperation we had with the research institution and others saved the day because between University of Stellenbosch, who really did help us to steer us in the right direction, Vertgen, who looked at, took one look at what we were doing and said, no, guys, no, 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 we can do this better. You know, Germans always do things better. And thankfully, they, they participated. And then we had the other researchers, our CSIR, the crowd up in Pretoria, who uh, take on all sorts of amazing research stuff. They helped us a lot with things like uh, the prototype pug mill mixer. So it was a, a real joint effort and we were able to move forward and to develop the technology. What's come out of it is the laboratory handbook that you have from Vertgen that explains the whole mixed design procedure and how you do things. We've just published the third edition of TG2 2020 that you can download free from the Sabita website. Sabita is the South African Bitumen Association. Um, they, they published it. That is the Bible. That is the current up-to-date Bible for bitumen stabilization. And in there, in Appendix B, you've got all the standard uh, laboratory test methods that are used for BSMs. And then we've just also published a, a, a user guide for how, how to actually do a mixed design. So that's all available. Um, and uh, we now believe that we are in, in a very strong position to, uh, to take this technology forward. Okay, let's look at the mixed design. Um, I'm, I'm, I could talk for about three weeks on this, but I, I'll keep it to the bones. There's six sequences in a mixed design. You first have got to get representative samples. Then you've got to determine are these materials suitable for, for stabilizing with bitumen? Then you have to prepare your samples for mixing. Remember, you're testing a specimen. And you are going to make multi-million dollar decisions on the test results. 
So the specimen you test had better be good. It had better reflect what you're going to get in the field. Then we mix the samples of foam bitumen and active filler. How do we do that? Condition them and finally test the specimens. Those are the six sequences. Okay, let's talk about sampling. Now I'm just gonna go through this very quickly, just the flow chart sampling. We sample, take um, the, the samples to the laboratory, uh, prepare them, do some initial tests and say, okay, are we dealing with a material that's suitable? If we're not dealing with a material that's suitable, we say, well, let's blend it. Let's make it suitable. What do we have to do to make it suitable? When we finally come right, we say, that's great. Now we prepare the samples for the, for, for the test. That is what we call phase one, material sampling and suitability. From there, we go on to phase two. Phase two is, do we need active filler? And how much bitumen do we need to add? That we achieve by, we treat samples with different amounts of uh, bitumen, different active fillers, and we make specimens, small specimens, 152 millimeters in diameter, the same as your uh, CBR specimens, but these are only 95 millimeters high. We condition them. In other words, we cure them, and then we test them. And what we get from these tests is the optimum mix. What gives us the best result for that specific material. So we know how much bitumen to add, we know which active filler to use. So then we go on to phase three and we use the, the, the results there to mix up a whole lot of uh, material, which then we use to make large specimens. These are 300 millimeters in diameter and 300, and 300 millimeters height. In other words, it's a two to one height to diameter ratio, which is perfect for triaxial testing. We then condition those we condition those at what we call equilibrium moisture content, which is the moisture content, long-term um, average moisture content of the material in the field in service. And then we test them. We test them, triaxial testing, and that gives us what we need to do a pavement design with confidence. So that's, the, uh, uh, that, that's a helicopter view of the mix design. Now, I don't want to launch into how we do this, that, and the other. I just want to look at some of the hot spots. What's really important in this mix design procedure? So we'll start with the sampling. The most important thing is to make sure that you have representative samples. Are you testing something that's there? Or are you fooling yourself? So you have to make sure that what you've got, excuse me, <coughs> your your material that you're going to subject to these tests is truly representative. If you're dealing with stockpile material, there's a whole lot of procedures to make sure that you sample correctly from the stockpile. If you're sampling in situ, there's a whole lot of procedures that you must follow in order to do um, proper sampling from a test bit. And just remember that uh, when you're doing a mix design, you need a lot of material. One triaxial specimen weighs in the order of 12 to 15 kilograms, and you need 10 for a triaxial test. So that's immediately 150 kilograms. And what you don't want to do is to run out of material and say, oops, gee, let's go and get some more. Because there's a good chance that what you get by going back to resample is not gonna be the same as a first. So you can't just combine a whole lot of different uh, test results. Okay. Next one is sample preparation. Um, when you bring the material to the laboratory, you've got to look after it. You've got to, you, you've got to really treat it with uh, tender loving care. And you, the first thing you do is air dry and you just m make sure that you don't contaminate your samples, that you don't uh, end up with two or three layers all blending into one. Because when you're sampling and when, you, when you're digging your test bits and sampling, if you have in mind that you're going to insert your recycle, you actually don't know how deep you're going to recycle. So you have to sample each layer separately and then reconstitute later. Okay, preliminary tests, what are they? Well, the first one is, what's your bitumen? Foaming characteristics, check your bitumen. Is it going to foam? The good news is that, I mean, we've worked all over the world except in Antarctica, and uh, only in one country have we found bitumen that doesn't foam. And that's because they don't want it to foam because they want you to buy the emulsion. So they put silicon into the bitumen so it doesn't foam. 
But otherwise, we can generally rely on local bitumens to give us decent foaming characteristics. The material you're dealing with, well, now, first thing you, must, you need to know what the hygroscopic moisture content is. In other words, your air dry moisture content. Then you do the normal range of tests, sub analysis gradings, your Atterberg limits to get the PI and your CBR. And then if you don't like what you see with that CBR, well, go and do an LA abrasion test. What's the durability? But the three that you're looking at, the three tests that are going to tell you whether you're, whether you're okay or not, is the gradings, the PI, and the CBR. Just a word on the CBR. We don't like working with material that's got a CBR of less than 50. And that 50 is measured when the density is 95% of the maximum dry density. So we're, we're not looking to use rubbish. We, we're looking to a material that's got potential. If the CBR drops below 50, then we'll do an LA abrasion test on it and see is it durable. If it's durable, we'll give it a chance. If it's not, we say, sorry, we'll find another material. And just a word on gradings. Remember, we always use the wash procedure. We wash the fines to make sure we're dealing with the right grading. We're looking for a continuous grading. Um, that's to get density. That's to get performance, you know, particle packing. But you need the fines. Uh, the, the black lines on that screen are the uh, recommended envelope for granular materials. What you want to avoid is your gap graded materials, that red line. That red line tells you that there's something missing there. There's something missing between the, uh, the 0.3 and the 2 millimeter. So that's not going to pack very well. Gradings are important. That's where we start looking at blends. If we don't have a decent blend, if we don't have a decent uh, parent material, we will look to blend. Good, okay. So if it fails, we'll blend and we'll do it all over again and, and carry on doing that until either we throw the material away and decide to do something else, or we find a suitable material for blending. Blend materials, what are the options? Um, processed wrap, that, that's always a good option because everybody's got a big stockpile of wrap. Um, but we like using processed wrap, put the wrap through an impact crusher, that the, the gap is set at the maximum particle size of the aggregate in the asphalt. And what you'll get out of that is a beautiful graded material. Won't be, no, it won't be much on the uh, 075, but wrap doesn't need too much on the 075 because wrap is um, old asphalt. So all the particles were previously covered with bitumen and they will accept the foam bitumen particles. The other options are graded crushed stone, crusher dust. We often use a crusher dust uh, as a blend. Um, or if we've got some decent borrow pits, we'll go and get some gravel out the borrow pit. The other option you've got is to say, well, let's not look for trouble. Let's change the recycling depth, maybe bring something on top, or maybe use a bit of asphalt instead of just relying fully on the VSM. But those are the options you have. Okay, moving on. Once we're happy that we've got a material that's going to work, then we go for the sample preparation, which is, uh, which is a, a very key uh, feature, in fact, it's probably the most important feature of the whole mix design is to make sure that your sample is prepared adequately. We eliminate the oversize. This is the to get the ratio between maximum particle size and uh, specimen diameter into acceptable limits. We work with everything under the 20 millimeters um, maximum size, but we don't throw it away. I'll explain that in a minute. The important one is your, your representative proportioning. You must take your sample and split it into little bits and put it back again to make sure that all the samples you work with for your ITS, for your triaxial, are identical. That's a key move. Okay. What we do is we separate, we put all the material through a shaker and we separate the, uh, into four fractions. And then we break down the, um, the particles over 20 millimeters to pass the 20 millimeter sieve, but be retained on the 14 millimeter sieve. Okay, so how this works is let's just say fraction Z, we've got 5%. Uh, we've got 25% passing the uh, 20, but retain on the 14. 30% passing the 14, retain on the 5, and then 40% passing the 5. Okay, now what we do is we take the oversize, put it through a lab crusher, screen it, 
anything that's still over 20 millimeters goes back again. What passes the uh, 20 millimeter um, and is retained on the 14 millimeter gets added to the uh, fraction A stock pile, the rest is thrown away. Okay, and we end up with three piles of, of, of uh, material, and that allows us to now reconstitute this and to get our samples for the modified proctor and the ITSs um, and triaxials and to pre-package them so that they are all the same. This is probably the most critical part of the whole mix design because you are now dealing with materials that are the same. I can't labor this point too much. Okay, the next one is to do the modified proctor test. Um, everything that we do with the mix design relates to the modified proctor. Maximum dry density determines, it will tells us what the density of the specimens must be. All specimens are manufactured at 100% of MDD. And the optimum moisture contest tell, content tells us what moisture content we need to be mixing at and compacting at. So those two values are dead critical. And that's what we need before we start. Okay. So now we get on to phase two. Um, and let's have a look at what's the, what are the hot spots here. Let's talk about mixing. Temperatures, yes, temperatures are critical. Everybody knows they're critical, but uh, it's not just the bitumen temperature that's critical. It's also the material temperature. It's the water temperature. It's the active filler temperature. We do all our tests at 25 degrees Celsius. The bitumen sits up at 160, minimum 160, 190 maximum. The temperatures are critical. If you leave your material outside, well, you wouldn't have that problem in Trinidad, of course. But uh, once you go north or south, it's, things get a little bit cold. And if you allow your material to cool down, say, below 15 degrees, you're going to get some strange results. So that's why we control the temperature of our aggregate at 25 degrees. Remember, accuracy is absolutely vital now. And that is why you need a foam bitumen unit that can give you an exact amount of bitumen. This is critical, okay? If you've got a 26 kilogram mix, and you wanna add different amounts of bitumen to different samples, the difference between the amount of bitumen you're adding is really small. But this is where the money is. And this is why you need to be able to do these tests at precise bitumen additions and then use those in your mix designs and use it on site. Just remember, if you take an average road, let's say we're gonna treat a 200 millimeter layer of existing material with bitumen, 0.1% change in the bitumen amount will cost you about 20 cents per square meter, okay? Now, if your road is 10 meters wide, that's $2 per linear meter. That's $200 per hundred meter. That's $2,000 per kilometer. And if your road that you're rehabilitating is 100 kilometers long, that's $200,000. The difference that 0.1% bitumen addition makes. And you can buy a lot of beer with $200,000. So this is serious stuff. Okay, equipment setup. You must set the pug mill and the foam bitumen unit up correctly. It's all about that fan jet. There's a fan jet at the end of the expansion chamber that squirts the foam bitumen into the mixer. Now to get that right, you get your mixer and you put a sheet of paper on the top and you blast 100 grams of foam bitumen in there. And you've got to make sure that that jet is aligned to squirt that bitumen into the middle of the mixer. You don't want the bitumen going onto the end of the mixer and not getting into the material. So this is a critical um, step and it's quite easy to adjust. Right, next is your specimen manufacturer. Remember your target density is 100% uh, of maximum dry density. What's nice about the Vertkin uh, uh, vibrating hammer compactor is it allows you to manufacture specimens in layers and and achieve the target of 100% of MDD. 
we manufacture the ITS specimens in two layers and the triaxial specimens in five layers. Now that sounds very nice, but anybody who's worked in a laboratory knows that when you play with layers, you have interlayer problems. You get, you get things happening on the interlayer. So you have to roughen the, one, the, the top of the one layer before compacting the next subsequent layer. And that's where we come up with an interlayer roughening device. It's a tool that you just use to roughen up the top of the layer. The other point is split molds are compulsory because these specimens are pretty big and they're easy to damage. So all specimens are made with sp split molds. Generally, we're dealing with a coefficient of variation on the density between uh, specimens below 15%. Um, and, and, and that's to be expected because we are aiming at a density. So we've, we've, we've taken away all the problems we used to have with impact uh, uh, compacted specimens because you can never get the, 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 the similar density with that. The vibrating hammer allows you to target a density and to get it. Curing, all curing is done at 40 degrees. That's below the softening point of bitumen. So the bitumen doesn't get up and walk around the specimen. So initially, all curing is 40 degrees. Your ITS specimens are cured to constant mass. It normally takes about 72 hours um, to get to that state. Your ITS specimens, you, you cure at 60 degrees of OMC. That's the attempt to get to equip equilibrium moisture content. And how you do that is you put the specimens in the oven for a set period of time. It's normally eight hours. Then you take them out and you wrap them in cling wrap or you put them in a sealed plastic bag and put them back in the oven to carry on sitting at 40 degrees for another 48 hours. The specimens for, for um, the wet conditions are soaked, submerged in a water bath at 25 degrees for 24 hours. ITS tests, now just remember all tests are conducted with a specimen at 25 degrees. That means not the surface temperature, that means the body of the, uh, the whole specimen must be at 25 degrees. And that takes some time to get these big specimens down to 25 degrees after sitting in an oven for a few days at 40 degrees. So you've got to allow that time, the conditioning. <coughs> Excuse me. Make sure the specimen is properly aligned between the heads before applying the constant displacement of 50.8 millimeters per minute. That's the same displacement rate as the Marshall test. And then we test three specimens dry and three specimens wet. And from that, we make the decision as to which is, is the correct amount of bitumen to, or the optimal amount of bitumen to add and which active pillar to add. And just one comment on that. Um, I think Kim will talk about it, but we never use more than 1% active filler. What is active filler? It's either cement, which is normally ordinary Portland cement, or hydrated lime. For the triaxial test, we work with pairs. We'd love to work with three specimens per test, but they're just too big. So we work with pairs, and what we do there is we test four sets of pairs, one at zero confining pressure, which gives us the unconfined um, compressive strength. Then we use 50, 100, and 200 kilopascal confining pressure. And then we also test two soak specimens at 100 um, kilopascal confining pressure. How that works, very simple. The Vertkin system, the Germans solve all our problems here. You make the big specimen, you drop over a standard bladder, put it in a confining cylinder, put it in the press, um, pump it up, pump up the bladder to the confining pressure you want. The system holds the pressure constant, and then you put your load at three millimeters per minute. That's 1% per minute until you get a state of failure. Okay, what we do with it, we plot every result. We don't average anything. So for the zero confining, we'll plot the two results. Same for the 50 uh, uh, kPa confining pressure. And we build our more Coulomb circles like that. And then we drop the uh, tangent line on and we get the cohesion angle of friction from that. The R squared value, um, if we get anything lower than 0.98, we start asking questions. And that reflects the confidence we have 
in the specimen manufacture and curing. Um, normally, if it drops below 0.98, we will find that there's something went wrong in the manufacture or in the curing. Okay, for the soaked to get the retained cohesion, we take two uh, specimens and we test them at 100 uh, kilopascal confining pressure. And then from that, um, we get the reduction in cohesion. And that's, 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 that's what we do. So structure, we, from all that, we get a structural design input, which we need, which is the cohesion, the angle of friction, and the retained cohesion. In other words, what does water do to the material? From a construction point of view, we get the blending details, we get the active filler to be applied, the amount of bitumen required, and the minimum density requirement. So that's what we get out of our mix design, and we are now very confident that the system we've arrived at in 2020 is the one that we will be using for a long time in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Dave. And we're going to go right on to um, Professor Jenkins to take out the second part of this presentation. Yeah. Right, seeing you, Kim. Can you see me? I can see and hear you. I'm seeing your screen as well. Are you seeing the screen as well? Yes. Okay, for some reason, I'm not seeing the screen. <laughs> okay, wait, I can see there. Um, Go down to the uh, to the bar down there and open the presentation again, because you're still but, in, in the scene. Yeah. Okay, um, but I've only got a, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Okay, now I'm going to share again. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Can you see me? Yeah, you can see your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, good morning, everybody. As Dave said, it's afternoon on this side. I think, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say it's a great pleasure to be back with uh, linking up with people in the West Indies again. I have the pleasure, as Dave has, and my colleagues too, um, of visiting a number of projects and being involved in the technology in the West Indies. And as we've heard, uh, South Africans really have uh, a lot in common with the West Indies, and we love to talk about cricket, don't we? Um, what I found in, in my career of working with people around the world is that the cricketers are a special group and it's a very difficult game to try to explain to others. For example, I have two colleagues from the Netherlands and I try to explain the cricket positions, the fielding positions. And when I told them, yes, you have a a silly mid-off and you have a short leg, they said to me, well, where do you find these people? How, are they quite happy that you call them a, a silly mid-off? And, and particularly when you say short leg and a third man, the Dutch say, yeah, is that the same thing or is there some difference? And um, if you talk about a fine leg, well, then they, uh, let's say, the Dutch have told me that, yeah, I've seen a few fine legs in my life. I told them, be careful now, you'll end up on the hashtag me too as well. So anyway, it's, it's quite difficult to explain these 
concept of cricket, uh, cricket and fielding. And it's also sometimes, it's quite a simple thing. As cricket is, BSMs is also simple at one level. However, as soon as you start getting into the detail, all of these things become a, a bit more complicated. So on, with that as a basis, let's launch into a bit of discussion about how we improve this technology and how we make it more cost effective. So from my side, you can see I'm, I'd like to talk a little bit about what goes into the design because the design is an important component. It's usually carried out by a quite specialist group of, of people that you meet in various countries, but it is all about quality data having uh, been able to use quality data to be able to do your design is the key. So what Dave has been talking about and Lawrence as well, I'll touch on that, particularly with Lawrence and his uh, local knowledge in the West Indies. But having quality data to design with is the key because we know garbage in is garbage out. And that certainly does apply for design. Just to endorse what Joachim said about the state of our globe, this is not an unusual picture. What you see here is about six, no, what is it? 26 years of data of road condition. And it's for, this is in one country, but more recently I was involved in a webinar with people from Illinois in the United States, and they showed very, very similar trends. And what you see here, is if the road condition is measured as very good in terms of the green proportion of the bars and good in the light blue, and on the other end of the scale, red is a poor condition of the road and purple is very poor. You can see in the last 20, 25 years and even longer that there's a significant reduction in the proportion of very good roads and a significant increase in the poor condition roads that we face globally. So this is, this is a challenging situation. And what goes with it, you heard about the impact of coronavirus, etc. Well, it goes even further than that, that in most of the authorities, whether it's the uh, national authority or down at municipal level, the budgets just can't be stretched to catch up this backlog of poor roads or high percentage of poor roads. So this is a reality. We're talking about design. So another thing we've got to consider is the rate of deterioration and what is our strategy to improve the and maintain a high level of riding quality, cost effectively. That's the key. So if we have a look at this diagram, we obviously want a number of interventions that will improve and sustain a high level, because we want it as high as possible on the y-axis, these resurfacings. If we start missing maintenance measures, then we're going to have this accelerated drop off. So we're looking for high durability and staged construction in these materials. Structural rehabilitation is important, and that's what we're generally talking about. But we want to defer it as much as possible because that will make it more cost effective. The, the structural rehabilitation. The other aspect is from what the previous slide that I showed you, it is a reliable assumption that we're spending much more budget on road rehabilitation and maintenance than building new roads. That is the, the state of the globe. That's a reality. 
there's a lot more fixing up and maintaining than building new roads. It's maybe doesn't seem as sexy, but it's just as important. In fact, maybe even more important. So what we can do besides the moisture sensitive materials drop off in um, riding quality, if we get a material such as a BSM, which is more moisture resistant, we can sustain that performance and sustain the riding quality for longer. So that's very important. So that's something we're considering. If I can put this into perspective for the materials that we're working with, where are our challenges and where are our possibilities? Well, wrap or reclaimed asphalt pavement is becoming more and more a major constituent in the recycling mixes that we work with. This re cold recycling technology started in the beginning in very modest ways where we were working with low to medium trafficked areas. So there was generally a thin asphalt surfacing or sometimes even just a surfacing seal over a granular base. But over the last 20, 25 years, as the technology has improved, so it's been used on higher and higher levels of traffic. And we had a question already about hot mix asphalt versus BSM. Well, just to give one thing into perspective, if we look at the first world countries, the European nation or the United States of America, there are limits of how much wrap you can put into hot mix asphalt. In hot mix asphalt, the third world is putting slightly less in, but there is a lot of access to hot mix asphalt because we're talking about rehabilitating a vast majority of, as Joachim said, those 18 to 20 million kilometers of roads we've got in the globe that um, are in place and need maintaining. However, and Dave alluded to it, when we work with BSMs, we can use high percentages of wrap, and we've got to consider this in the design. And considering in the design, we've got to think about the sheer properties of the material. So the first thing is with BSM technology, we can use a higher proportion of reclaimed asphalt. And we also know how to, must know how to apply it and get the best performance out of it. So what makes it important is the material costs are 70% of the pavement costs and the BSM costs are between 20 to 45% cheaper than hot mix asphalt costs. So here, just from an economic point of view, we can justify the place for BSM in, in the pavement. And as somebody said, there's no exclusion of different materials, whether it's cement stabilized or hot mix asphalt, there's a place for everything. We've got to find the best equilibrium and optimal balance of the different materials to get the most cost-effective structure. So just reminding ourselves in terms of the designs that we're working with currently, we know that over the years, if we look more than the last century, so we're going back into the 20th century and into the 21st century, a lot of the pavement designs were based on experience and that we called empirical designs. With time, there were developments with the um, core of engineers where the CBR cover design was produced and later on, the ASHTO structural number system, where well, I'm going to be talking about another one that Lawrence actually showed in a few of his slides using the pavement number system. And ultimately where we see ourselves now is into this mechanistic empirical type of design where we still have this basis of experience, but now we have 
a higher consideration of the materials that are used in the pavement and the models that link the material characteristics to the performance. So what we're talking about now is a pavement structure, uh, structure where we're really interested in the thicknesses, the stiffness of the layers, or you can call it the resilient modulus, as well as the Poisson ratio. And once you analyze the pavement structure, taking those uh, measurements into account, as well as with the mechanics, which are stresses and strains, we can put the key performance parameters through a transfer function to determine the life of the road. So what I'll be focusing on is two key areas for pavement design. That's the pavement number system as well as this, as well as this mechanistic empirical design system. Sorry about that. Um, I wasn't expecting a Skype call. Failure mechanisms. Let's just look at where we've come from and where we're going. I would say in the first half of the 20th century and then going into the second half of the century, there was a fair bit of work done with cement stabilized base layers. But as we know, th these are subject to crushing and shrinkage cracking, particularly from the top and ultimately fatigue cracking, which comes from the, um, the traffic. What happened thereafter from the 60s going into more the 70s and the 1980s was realizing that the cement stabilization, which creates a very stiff layer, is more suited to the sub-base. And if we can get really good compaction of a high quality crushed stone base above, this is a cost effective solution. And it's worked for many areas, but as you know, in the West Indies, as we know in South Africa, in the wet zones, if water gets through that surfacing, then you get rapid deterioration or moisture accelerated distress of that base layer. So, we needed to find more moisture resistant materials. And one way was to use those fantastic continuously graded base layers, good quality crushed stone base, and recycle it with either foam bitumen or emulsion to create this BSM. And we're gonna have a look at how do we work out what thicknesses do we need of these layers? to get the right life out of the pavement. While Dave was busy there, <laughs> I just was reminded that as from what he was saying that I should also just mention how important flexibility is. So, so I added this slide in, in the last couple of minutes. And if we look on the horizontal axis at this, the amount of cement that we're adding in this BSM, which is usually a, a small amount, but I'm going to show you why we need to control it. The amount of cement versus the amount of bitumen that's going into the mix. If we look at the tensile strength, that, then we know in terms of that ratio, if we add more cement than bitumen, we're definitely going to get a strong mix. So we're going from weak to strong as we add more cement. That sounds very enticing. So your RTS test, your indirect tensile strength, or the unconfined compressive strength improves as you add more cement. However, this is one of our lab apparatus where we do a monotonic beam test, you can also do dynamic tests, but just with a monotonic test, you look at, at what level of strain you apply a constant load, at what level of strain it breaks. And what you'll find, the more cement that you add, the more you go from a flexible pavement material because it's dominated by the bitumen but you're adding more cement so it becomes dominated by the cement and it becomes rigid so clearly that is not what we want if we're looking for flexibility which is going to give us long life the next important thing links with what dave was explaining 
and is clearly an important part of our whole design process. And that goes around the material properties and their classifications. So just if we step back for a moment, there are many ways of, of um, investigating the existing roads and evaluating them. And here are just a few examples. Falling weight deflections, test pits, you can take materials out of the road and test them, as well as get the different uh, thicknesses of the layers that are in the road. Visual assessments, where we gauge the number of cracking, the, the amount of rutting, etc., and give a visual condition index, for example, and dynamic cone penetrometers. Those are just four, and there are others. But the point is, 30, 40 years ago, there were a lot of the pavement engineers would spend more time out there on the road working with these different uh, tests and would collectively evaluate the results that came in to give a combined impression of the, um, the state of the road and what uh, you are designing for. In the modern era where we've got this digital age and the fourth industrial revolution, et cetera, and a fo focus on digital things, we've lost some of that practical knowledge of the, the old road makers, as we used to call them, um, working with these different tests and knowing how to do it. So some colleagues of ours, um, with a little bit of input from our, ourselves, so it's, it's a, quite a South African thing, um, developed a system based on reliability concepts and fuzzy logic to use that information to determine the state of the road and the condition of the different layers. What you do is for each test, like the deflection measurements, You've got limits for very poor, poor, good, etc. In other words, different classes that you would put the material into based on the different tests. As we know, these tests are incongruent in terms of the units that they measured in and how they link to performance. So this was one way using a triangular distribution with typical limits for the specific test to judge what classification it fits into. And the categories of these classifications were obviously with granular materials, we have 10 different classifications from poor, which would be a G10, to excellent, which would be a G1. And you would have these different limits to be able to demarcate which area you're in. And there's obviously a classification for cemented materials, etc the road building materials. So that uses a triangular distribution as opposed to the bell curve that you would use in your normal statistical distribution. Just a simplification. So from that, the amount of area in a specific triangle, the proportion of, for example, dark green in the overall triangular area gives you a reliability percentage for that specific classification. So that's the certainty of the class. The second thing is the, the certainty of the material that needs to additionally filter this analysis of classification. And this means that you're obviously going to get a lot more reliable information out of a triaxial test than an ITS test. So that would influence their certainty factors. And the same applied for FWDs, uh, DCPs, et cetera. And then obviously, <laughs> if you do one test, it's not gonna be very reliable. If you do 10 tests, you have much more reliability. So the sample size is important. So this is now cumulatively analyzed, these different factors. And this comes up with a classification, design equivalent classification. So this is not for new materials. This is using materials that are existing in the road. So after 20 years at the end of the design life, for each of the layers, we have an idea of 
what condition are they in and in other words in and what is their future performance ideally and then we can use that information with our structural design so out of those two what has changed the two design methods now i'm talking about the pavement number design which is similar to the structural design uh, the the structural number that ashto used this has been recently updated dave collings mentioned the tg2 the guideline manual for bsms that has been um, published this year just a couple of months ago so what information has gone into the new manual well first of all since the last one it's 11 years and in those 11 years we've now got 69 long-term pavement performance sections whereas previously 11 years ago we only had 20 sections these are road sections with either bsm foam or bsm emulsion in them and then some catalogs as well in terms of the structural issues in this pavement number design system it's a it's a very simple system to implement but very clever thinking went into developing it and obviously nothing is perfect because now you are classifying the roads as in a good condition a warning condition or a poor condition so you're basically not using the mechanistic numbers like the stresses and strains inside the material you're looking at the overall performance of certain pavement structures and the design system was found to be under a bit conservative under contributing with the cement treated base layers and over contributing for the asphalt so that needed some adjustment which happened this up to this year also it was limited to 50 millimeters of um asphalt in the pavement structure however we have heavier structures becoming the norm so that needed to be changed and has and previously also the the base layers used in the pavement number system were granular and cemented um, but the asphalt base layers weren't included and now they are and then there's some new things uh, in terms of adjustment factors that you don't have to worry about but these things give you a real uh, a result with more of a realistic outcome very simply i will just take you through um, how a design like this works so if you're wanting to design a pavement of this nature and you're working um, with a what we'd call a g7 and uh, granular material as your subgrade then the material classes would give you some guidance as to the subgrade stiffness that is related to that cbr value if you are designing for a combination of these pavement layers above then okay the first thing is you need to design for the climatic region that you're in so it takes account of a dry versus a moderate versus a wet climate as well as the combined thicknesses of all the pav pavement layers that are anticipated to be used in the design the second step links with what joachim was talking about which is the modular ratio so based on you can see these materials over here we've got a granular material that's got a, a pretty good cbr above 15 and up to 25 and here we've got a cement stabilized material it could be a c3 or c4 so this is a certain selected standard and then a bsm we have two different classifications this is the slightly weaker one so would not go with for the heaviest traffic but the point is each of those classifications um, from experience and from analysis have got different maximum stiffnesses so basically that modular ratio is provided by the classification of the material and from that it's also guided in that there's a maximum stiffness that it can reach so i'll just give you one example this layer over here 
the stiffness can be 1.8 times the stiffness of the layer below, the supporting layer. That's what happens with modular ratio. Or it must be a maximum of 180. You couldn't, if this value came to higher than 200 MPA, you would still have to limit it to 180 because that's a, um, a limit that is going to govern the maximum that it can reach. So very simply, we are using in this system, as soon as you use a certain classification of material, it will allocate the stiffness for you and it does these classifications. So the example that I told you, the um, support of 119 megapascals after all those adjustments that have been done would multiply by 1.8 would give you 214, but the maximum can be 180. So then the equivalent long-term stiffness is 180. And so you would move up the pavement and um, allocate those, the equivalent long-term stiffnesses, which is giving you an idea of the sustained load spreading ability of the layers in the pavement. With that information, we can calculate for the whole pavement a pavement number. First of all, layer by layer, with the layer thickness multiplied by that stiffness and the adjustment factors that I mentioned. And then the overall pavement number for the all layers would be the sum of these pavement numbers for each layer. What is the difference with the Ashto method? Well, here we are taking into account the interaction between the layers because that's basically what the modular ratio is doing for you. What's been developed further is also, this is the design system for the pavement number. So from this previous calculation that I just showed you, if this cumulative pavement number came out at a value of 25, then we would say, okay, there's 25, the pavement number. With the old system, it was a stepped function because there was very limited data. And we would have said 25, you go up and then across, and then that means the life of the pavement is 10 million standard axles. Currently, we've there has been uh, more data applied over the last 11 years, as you would have seen in the stats that I showed you. So we've got more, a type of sigmoidal, but it's a linear sigmoidal type of function that also is designed now, because based on data, to go up to 40 million standard axles, because those are the pavements that have already been exposed to that amount of traffic. So from the old one, which was limited to 30 million, in the last 11 years, we've got data that's taking us into higher realms because you don't want to extrapolate and say, okay, this function can go off at another angle that you're not sure of when you are doing structural design. So we've got a much more reliable function here as well as different reliability limits. So you can see category A road is more conservative because it designs for a 95% reliability, whereas category B, which is slightly higher up, designs for a 90% reliability. Just to give you some idea about this is not a completely exact science, we would expect the pavements below this design frontier. Remember, it's not using mechanistic principles, so it's not using stresses and strains. This goes on sound, warning, severe conditions for the pavement. And you will have examples of pavements that haven't failed yet that are below the line. As they are trafficked over the years, the, the pavement number will stay the same, but they will move up vertically and then they would come into a warning condition when they meet the frontier. What you see over here is a really special situation with the data. This is a concessionaire. And as you can see, um, 
this makes the design function look conservative, but this concessionaire's road performance is exceptional because there is the periodic maintenance is, is rigorously carried out. It doesn't miss that maintenance that should happen uh, this year, but then is pushed out till next year. No, it happens. And if that happens, here's an example for, um, oh, it's 20 years. The data has shown that the deflections in those in that pavement has remained constant. The average and the maximums, there's some variability, but one would ex expect the maximum deflections to increase over time as the, the layers become damaged. But if you are really rigorous and check that the periodic maintenance is always done, this is one way to preserve a pavement. And it's something we've got to consider in terms of sustainability. Okay, so now to move on to the other options, we need to, another options in terms of design uh, using the mechanistic empirical way, we really need to have knowledge on the materials. And if we very briefly uh, highlight where they lie on a two-dimensional matrix, if we've got the cement in this granular material on the vertical axis, and obviously 0% of that would give you granular, and the flexible side, the bitumen on the horizontal axis, we, we know that if you add cement, then we've got a CTB or cement stabilized base. If we add bitumen, we've got an asphaltic base and possibly surfacing too. But bitumen stabilized materials, BSMs, they have in the order of half the amount of bitumen that you would use in your hot mix asphalt. That's typical. And then as I showed you about the flexibility, the cement application is not used to get a high stiffness. So it's generally limited to 1%. Because as we saw on that diagram, the more cement you add, yes, you get higher strength, but you're losing flexibility. So that is the thinking around it. And obviously, these granular materials and bitumen stabilized materials with minimal amount of active filler. The active filler is primarily there for better dispersion of the bitumen droplets that you heard about. And the second thing is for even more moisture resistance because they keep the bonds together. We've got granular type behavior here or non-continuously bound behavior. Then we were designing for rutting or permanent deformation in this lower zone of the matrix. As we move across this imaginary line, we move into the bound realm, which Joachim very nicely explained, particularly with the rigidity of the materials with highly cement stabilized or combination of the two, going into also hot mix asphalt, which is a bound material. Then you're dealing with fatigue, and that's a different design mechanism. And when at the end of the design life, that material is kaput, it's not just deformed. What we also need to do when we move into the mechanistic empirical design approach, we, we need to take care of this resilient modulus. What is the stiffness? And here is a project just before the 2004 Olympic Games, 2002, 2003. And here you can have a look. Dave was very closely involved. I've also spent time on this project. Very interesting project. But what you see with the results is that after construction with bitumen stabilized materials, they always have moisture in there as well as the bitumen and the active filler. But with curing in the initial six months to a year, you will see an increase in stiffness. So you don't want to design the road for one day after construction. No, no, it's even under traffic, it's going to increase in stiffness. So we need to take account of that in the design. And after that, if you've got a balanced pavement structure, in other words, abiding by that modular ratio guidance, 
then you should be able to sustain that stiffness over time. So in order to make a design function, if I can set the scene, so we're sitting now in a situation where we have design functions for asphalt with pavements with asphalt bases, pavements with cement treated bases, pavements with granular bases, but nothing with in terms of a mechanistic design function, mechanistic empirical design function for bitumen stabilized materials. So with all the data that we have at Stellenbosch University, we got postgraduate students in particular one uh, Carl Biermann to gather a lot of data to be able to develop a reliable design function. So this is the information that we need to develop that function. Particularly the traffic data is important. We need a number of BSM projects and uh, the selection criteria needs to be carefully considered. What it came down to was 14 long-term pavement performance sections that, that were used for the analysis. That's quite a lot of data. Each of those obviously had BSM emulsion or BSM foam. 23 uniform sections for evaluation. So that is a section where you have a standard design all the way. There were accelerated pavement testing sections, more than four of those that were treated with a heavy vehicle simulator or a model load simulator um, that was used for the evaluations. And then different pavement ages between five and 30 years and in five different macroclimatic uh, regions. As we can see here, <clears throat> these are the typical values for the bitumen stabilized material stiffnesses to be used in the design, they are quite conservative because these results on, in these bars stretch way beyond these uh, minimum limits that are established, with one exception that was uh, has explanation about the reasons for the lower stiffness in that region. But this long-term pavement performance information is very important for your design input of the resilient modulus because it is an important component in the analysis. Now, Dave Collings talked about more Coulomb analysis and using shear properties to do the classification of the materials, whether it meets the BSM-1 cohesion and friction angle. Well, it's not only for the classification, as Dave alluded to, it also has a role to play in the structural design. So mixed design actually feeds in stru into structural design. So how do we go about doing this? Well, in a mechanistic empirical design approach, we look at the critical stresses in the bitumen stabilized layer as we do in the other layers, but I'm specifically focusing on that design component because the granular layers, the asphalt layers are accounted for, but we need to design for bitumen stabilized layers in the whole pavement system. So we use that information based on a standard axle truck wheel, the critical stresses that are imposed in the pavement, remembering that it's more a granular type behavior. So we can look at the shear properties to determine the performance. We can plot that situation of sigma one, the major principal stress, and sigma three, the minor principal stress. And if we plot it on the Moore Coulomb, where we've got shear stress and normal stress, we get a Moore circle. That's well and good, but we've got nothing to benchmark it against. So what we do, is we use the outcomes from the mixed design. So the BSM material was compacted into specimens in the laboratory and tested with a triaxial test. And that is load to failure. And those tests would have this, the more Coulomb circles just touch the design 
frontier over here, uh, which is the failure envelope, and then provide a cohesion and a friction angle for the bitumen stabilized material. Hey, but our actual stress in the a BSM layer in the road is less. It's not touching the failure envelope. So it's all cool. Uh, it's cool in the sense that one load is not going to fail the pavement. However, the closer this actual stress circle is to the failure envelope, the closer it comes, the more proportion of damage you're going to get. In other words, the faster the rutting will take place. So this is the function that we use. We create an imaginary maximum function for that same actual stress circle over there. So you can see the confinement sigma three, the major principal stress sigma one, that's simulated in the road. And this would be from your mixed design, the failure stress circle. The ratio of those two diameters is the deviator stress ratio. And that deviator stress ratio determines how fast the rutting is going to take place. So if that circle diameter is half the size of that circle's diameter, then you have a 50% 50, 50 ratio. And that links with how much damage takes place. Because from our laboratory test with repeated loads, for example, in that situation, we will have a contour that tells us about the um, rate of rutting. And as you can see, I, I mentioned a 50%. So that would be a 0 0.5 contour that would fit in over there. But if you can reduce the stress, in other words, make the BSM layer thicker, that circle gets a bit smaller. And so the deviator stress ratio gets smaller. And so the rutting on the vertical axis gets less. So this template comes from laboratory testing. You don't need to use it in the design. Well, you don't need to redo those tests in the design. You use the values coming out of your analysis to work out how many load repetitions can you have to get to 10 millimeters rutting, if that's your limit that you're setting, which is a typical limit for a road pavement. Otherwise, you start getting uh, ponding of the water on the road and aquaplaning. So that's the system. That, so in other words, this deviator stress ratio that you calculate from the results that you have, the shear strength of the material, is going to determine how fast the rutting takes place. Um, Carl Biermann, as you can see, developed a lot of data from the different uniform sections with BSMs, bitumen stabilized material. And the function needed to be calibrated from the LTPP results that were evaluated to create as much as possible a one-to-one -one relationship between the actual number of load repetitions to a certain amount of failure, as well as the transfer functions influence. So you can see there's pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship, and that gives us confidence in the design function. In addition, Cole Biermann evaluated the data in terms of what we could call a 50% reliability limit, which would mean that you're designing for the average value that you're getting from your data because it's obviously up and down below the design function. But one needs to, to adjust this and reevaluate it to get a limit for, for example, 80, 90, or 95 percent reliability based on the importance of the road from farm rural road farm to market going up through arterial up to the most important road a highway would need the highest reliability so at the end of its design life theoretically only five percent of the pavement surface would have failed at that point the mechanistic empirical design function I won't bore you with 
all the details, but basically it has four different input parameters. The one is this level of rutting or percentage of plastic strain, permanent deformation, all the same thing. As you can see over here, based on the reliability, there are different coefficient values that come into the function depending on the level of reliability that you're working with. There's another variable to be considered, and that's the percentage of maximum dry density. So if you get 100% of maximum dry density, you push up this number, the PMDD, which is going to obviously increase your life. Retained cohesion is the same triaxial testing, but now you test the specimens once they've been uh, conditioned with water for 24 hours at 25 degrees, and you want to retain the shear strength. In other words, you want to retain the cohesive strength. And based on those results, you need to put in a value based on your mixed design results. And then finally, what we've just spoken about, which is the deviated stress ratio, is an important component in this design function that comes from the mixed design as well as the stresses in the pavement. And as you can see, it's even to the power three. That came out of the analysis for the design function. So the combination of all of these will give you the number of load repetitions to failure. Does the function work? Well, we did some correlations between that pavement number system, the updated one, as well as the mechanistic empirical function. As you can see over here, this is one example, I must say, here you can see the pavement structure with a bitumen stabilized base of 25 centimeters. This um, pavement number system between a category A road, the 95% was your highway, and this would be your arterial, is somewhere between 16 million standard axles to 21 million standard axles. As you can see, the um, mechanistic empirical function is slightly different, uh, slightly more conservative for this specific pavement structure, but it's certainly in the same ballpark and it does also provide for reliability limits. The differences here is also that the layers, if you've got a 25 centimeter BSM layer, you can also evaluate it as two sub layers because the stiffness of the upper portion is probably, well, generally always higher than the stiffness of the lower part of the layer because of stress distributions. So we're very happy with the outcome of these two design systems and that's what we're working with. When you're designing, you might get really good mixed design results for the bitumen stabilized materials. However, if you go and design for your excellent results of your bitumen stabilized materials, you might not always be able to replicate that in the road. And this is why we give default values based on the classifications of BSM-1, the best BSM material, and BSM-2, a less uh, high-performing material, but also a really good base layer. What's new? Okay, first of all, these yellow values are the default values that would be recommended when you're doing the design, the ones in parentheses. The second thing is, what is really new in terms of our evaluations come back, comes back to what I said right in the beginning, is that wrap or reclaimed asphalt is considered as a very important component. And now it's even a differentiator in terms of performance and shear properties. So we have two different classifications of a BSM-1. The one is made with let's say a thin surfacing, so it's less than 50% of wrap in the mix. Whereas the second possibility is where you've got, yes, getting into really deep asphalt layers that are recycled. They 
distressed more than likely and then get recycled and then we've got a, a different um, set of limits that we use to classify these materials which also then influences the design so in addition to that dave mentioned the introductory testing for uh, the mix design we use when we're looking at a lot of variables we use the ITS tests to evaluate a number of variables and as you can see we've made a an increase this is going up from 100 to 125 a more consistent um, sorry more conservative limit for the ITS values based on our experiences with the materials so this is the living design method where we keep changing it as we go along but it's refining it it's getting tighter and tighter and we know where the limits are getting a much better idea mm -hmm. so ladies and gentlemen to round off um i would just like to say if we, if we consider this combination of different types of materials if we've got a pavement with a granular base and granular support etc we might want to get higher performance or we expect heavier traffic so how do we do that so i've shown some typical stiffness values so here here are the same supporting layers but for the base what should we be aiming for should we be aiming for a very high stiffness base layer well if we go for a, a bitumen stabilized material a, a modular ratio would of four would give us a stiffness there of about 800. Some people might think, yeah, but I can make a cement treated base and now I'm going to get close to 3000 MPA, almost like the asphalt. Yeah, that's well and good for cemented materials, but we know there's going to be shrinkage and there's going to be cracking. So mother nature is going to bring down that modular ratio over there you can see 300 what's that eight times 350 yeah eight times it's way over the limit of three something like that for the modular ratio uh, five absolutely maximum but that's why it cracks however on this side if we cement stabilize the sub base so you got ctsb cement treated sub base we can get a good stiffness of that layer which will even improve the stiffness of the BSM layer up to a, a thousand MPA. And that's the order of stiffness we're looking for because it, that's then got a modular ratio of three with the asphalt surfacing, which is going to give the asphalt a longer life because it has better support. So in conclusion, um, the, I, I think I put this conclusion together as almost a summary of the different aspects that were covered. Pavement investigation is shown to be very important. And up until now, there hasn't been sufficient rehabilitation strategy and also evaluation of the pavement specifically for cold recycling. And now the evaluation procedures have taken account of that. So that's a move in the right direction. In terms of the mixed design, the performance-based needs have taken us from ITS to triaxial. The testing skills, um, yes, there are some new tests, but they, it's not rocket science. When one starts using, let's say, mono, uh, monotonic triaxial testing. So training and certification is a way to ensure quality testing, and that's very important. And then the material linked to structural design was non-existent 10 years ago. Now we have a much stronger link through the shear properties that are provided. Um, in terms of the structural design, I spoke about the pavement number system. There were some biases previously from the work of 2009. It wasn't that bad, but there was definitely room for improvement. And these have now been updated and improved. And then the unrealistic attempt at a mechanistic design system, I wouldn't even call it a complete one um, because it had the wrong failure mechanisms, et cetera. 
has now changed completely with this new mechanistic empirical design method. And as you saw, particularly from Lawrence's uh, uh, presentation, that there are places for both in place, in, in place and in plant recycling. And particularly the technology had its launch with uh, in place recycling, but more recently, in order to uh, reduce the variability in the material in plant recycling. So I've got in place and in place. One of them should be in plant and that one should be the one that is now reducing the variability. So thank you very much for your attention and I will gladly uh, respond to any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jenkins. Um, we just have some time for a couple of brief questions. Um, let me just tell you that you can keep posting your questions so that even if we have to end the, the webinar because it's close to our ending time, we will be able to answer those questions by email to you. But I'll open the floor up. Um, we can we have some questions from the audience? Yes, we do. Um, and just to answer the, the last question that was posed, Ray, yes, the video recording will be shared uh, with, with everyone uh, in, in the very near future. So all your emails were provided, and so we will send the information to those emails as well. Now the first question is for Kim. It's a question that was asked much earlier. What effect does low temperature, as in below zero, and high temperature above 50 degrees have on BSM? Um, thank you, Dr. Ellis. Uh, okay, so firstly, one has to consider temperature in context. Temperature of the aggregate at the time of mixing, if that is below zero, then you're in deep trouble. Whether you're using emulsions or foam bitumen, it's strongly recommended that you don't try to create a mix with the aggregate around zero. Let's take an example, and Dave has personal experience with uh, this. I have, well, not in the same place. Dave has got experience in Alaska. I have experience in other countries, um, not quite as cold, but that's uh, an extreme condition. But if you do your construction in the summertime, your aggregates can be, for example, 15 to 20 degrees where you can create BSM. So you construct them in 15 to 20 degrees. As you've seen that once you've got the compaction, once you've done the mixing, got the compaction, your bitumen droplets are dispersed through the mix. So they're not in contact with each other. And what they found in, for example, that extreme case of Alaska is that in the winter where their roads with asphalt surfacing would get these thermal cracks as a result of the shrinkage of the binder, the bitumen in the surfacing layer, with the bitumen stabilized material, these discrete droplets will shrink slightly, but they, they little droplets and they're not creating shrinkage in the whole uh, pavement and in the whole uh, BSM layer. So it was, they, well, we knew it all along, but it had to be implemented in the construction. But when the Alaskan road authorities and contractors, et cetera, had a look at this, they couldn't believe that it didn't get shrinkage cracking. And that is one of the big advantages. And now we're talking about, Dave will give you the, the, temperatures, but minus 30, minus 35 degrees Celsius, although Fahrenheit comes together with Celsius, I think, at those temperatures, but it was very cold. I could use another word, but I, very cold might be enough of an <laughs> emphasis. I understand the use of the term. Um, <laughs> we'll jump to Lawrence. Maybe you could answer this question. Can BSM be used as an overlay on asphalt? Remember to unmute your mic as you speak, Lawrence. Sorry. Yeah, um, we have, um, BSMs are actually stabilized materials that are used in bases and sub-bases. Um, I know that the voids is probably a bit more increased as you would expect with the asphalt surfacing. So it has to be sieved in order to extend its payment long-term performance. 
Um, and this is actually in use locally here. I mean, suppose um, Professor Jenkins and Mr. Collins will expand further, but most of the times we actually seal them to ensure that they, um, they have an extended long-term performance because of these worries. Okay, great, thanks. Dave, a question to you now. Um, we've heard a lot about the positives of BSM. So what are some of the drawbacks in, of BSM in road infrastructure? And just remember, until you're right, there we go. Um, the, the, the biggest problem that I've come across is that people don't understand the technology. So it becomes a construction problem um, and, and they, and they just, they need training. It's like, just like any other uh, construction method. I mean, anybody doing asphalt needs to be trained in how to use it. It's exactly the same with, uh, with BSM. So most of the problems we have is where either the uh, technology has been applied inappropriately, where there's been no uh, investigations and they've tried to stabilize rubbish, doesn't work, or they don't know what they're doing. Um, they treat the material too dry um, it, it, it's the understanding of the material is lacking, but uh, once you once you know what you're doing with these materials, they they they're very forgiving, and uh, man, I I as long as people take them seriously, they work. I don't know any drawback other than uh, uh, lack of appreciation of what you're doing. Okay, so so given that you still have you on the floor, what about using the recycled aggregate pavement? Uh, material in BSM. What what problems do we have in using that, using wrap? The only problem I've come across using wrap is uh, if you try and and uh, use a uh, a recycled asphalt that is still alive. In other words, it's still sticky. Um, you, you're not going to get a non-continuously bound material. It's actually going to bind up because of the old binder which is not very old, you, you, you end up with a continuously bound material. To avoid that, what we do is we blend it with crusher dust, minimum 15%, and anything up to uh, 30%, just to make sure that we get that non-continuous bound material. Um, otherwise, wrap is amazing stuff, but there is one problem. Um, just be careful of what is in the wrap. Uh, recycled bitumen rubber um, asphalt, uh, not, not, a, not a very clever thing to do because your um, rubber um, is still very spongy and it doesn't allow you to get the density. But otherwise, wrap is amazing stuff. Okay. All right. Last question I ask you, Dave, before we switch over to Lee asking some questions. So has the material been used in airport pavements as well? Thank you for asking that question. Yes, indeed. And uh, even the FAA allow allow you to come up with some clever materials. Yes, we do have a section of the um, taxiway on uh, Johannesburg International Airport that was put down about 10 years ago with foam bitumen. And there's lots of, most of the airport uh, structures in South Africa do have a bitumen stabilized base, but a very high quality aggregate was treated with either foam bitumen or bitumen emulsion. Okay, great. Thanks much. Lee, would you like to ask? Yes, I have some questions for Engineer Joachim. Um, are you in me clearly? Yes. Um, really? The, the person, the person um, they are actually asking an advice. Um, locally, what do you think needs to be done to have the government or the road agencies to buy into the BSM technology? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question if I would um, <clears throat> well I think it's uh, more what has to be done so what what does the government uh, need I mean uh, governments and and politicians uh, uh, they have to take some very tough decisions nowadays you know and uh, money is uh, as we say we have a lot of crisis on our hands so uh, um, they are not sitting in very comfortable seats because whatever they do, they will be criticized, you know. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a, lot, a lot of people uh, uh, bash uh, 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 polit politics and governments. What I think is what Dave said before is uh, listen to the, to the specialists. And this is where I appreciate this type of, uh, of initiatives. Uh, and I think we should uh, 
you guys and we can help there. Uh, we can bring this to the people. <clears throat> and um, as we said, as I said in my presentation, this is a proven technology. And as, as uh, Kim and Dave have said, it, but it's still being improved. Uh, having said that, in almost every South American country, we have BSM structures. Yeah, we have BSM experiences, and we have very, uh, uh, we have very uh, uh, positive experiences. But there's also been some bad experiences because uh, the people are always pushing the envelope. They're pushing the the, the boundaries, and 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 that comes down to uh, do the things properly. And uh, here you have the team. Uh, we we are there from Wittgen to help. Uh, there is Loudens to help. And um, we don't want anybody, as we say in Spanish, to buy the cat in the bag. Um, we're, we're willing to go and test it. We're, we're willing to prove it. Yeah? But uh, that has to, and that, that has always worked perfectly. When, whenever we've gotten an opportunity, like say, give me 15 kilometers, you have a problem, um, and, and we can uh, actually involve uh, Mr. Uh, we can involve Kim, we can involve Dave, and also uh, I have to say here, uh, Res and Sil. It's uh, a big, big thanks to Res and Sil and all the support they are, they are actually giving throughout the the whole area of the Caribbean and uh, and Central America. Um, if if these forces work together, then uh, uh, the, the 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 convincing of governments is is easy because the results speak for themselves, and they speak for themselves very quickly. Well, we can, we, and you know, there's one thing in, in, the, in the presentation from Lawrence is, um, and Kim just said it in, at the end of his presentation, we kind of, um, you know, changing over to implant, not saying that uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the recycling in situ is, is, is not applicable, but implant gives you a lot of, of, of advantages and you can actually do two, three, four hundred meters, and, and, and which is a little bit more difficult with an, with the with the in situ recycler. But it, as I said, if we get the right team on the on the on the ground, uh, uh, we can actually make uh, the point very quickly and easily. Yeah. Last question. Yes, one for your response. Um, last question is for Lawrence. Um, since you are representing UB, uh, what tests does the University of the West Indies do in terms of performance testing of BSM or even as for concrete materials? Thank you. Um, I know the university's um, laboratory facilities has been upgraded recently and can carry out a uh, lot of performance testing on asphaltic concrete, um, stiffness, fatigue, um, rotten, rotten with um, wheel tracking. Um, in terms of BSMs, what I think um, is most significant and has actually initiated was some in-service payment tests. And I know the LWD is probably the most accessible at this time. And I think that should be able to give us some sort of information as to how these payments are behaving. They have been designed in the lab, they have been constructed, um, particularly using the best practices. And we'd want to probably at least obtain some additional data on how they are performing in service. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Thank you very much, panelists. Thank you very much, um, attendees. Um, you've all stayed in more or less. Um, I just want to, before I, I wrap up, I just want to invite um, you being um, a gentleman who has been instrumental in bringing this whole thing together. Um, that is um, Senor Jose Luis um, from Resancil. Jose Luis Pataliana. Um, yes. you want to say a few words before we close off? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tausen. Uh, basically, on behalf of Residency, which is the company responsible for Vitkan Group in the whole uh, Caribbean islands and Central America, we'd like first to express our special gratitude to Ms. Cherry Ali at the marketing meeting of the University of West Indies in Trinidad. She was very professional, organized this seminar for all of us very successfully. So congratulations, uh, Ms. Ali, for this. Also, I would like to give a special thanks to uh, Dr. Towson, Dr. Lee, Engineer Rich Mohan at the University of West Indies in Trinidad, and Dr. Ellis at the University of West Indies in Jamaica. 
They all have been supporting Vetkin and Resancil and positioning all the different technologies uh, through the region. Um, it was a great pleasure uh, seeing all the presentations and I'm very honored to have our friends and, and panelists from Vitken and Loden, engineer Wahin Kem from Germany, from Vitken, Dr. Kim Jenkins from Loden International, engineer Dave Collins from Loden International, and, and Mr. Uh, Martin Dickman, who is not here, is also supporters from, from Germany and the headquarters. Uh, they've been quite of, uh, a lot of supporters of what we do in the whole region. Thank you, gentlemen, for this. And finally, and, and very important, of course, uh, I would like to express uh, to our thanks to the participants from, for the different countries in the Caribbean, islands and Central America. Special thanks to, to all our clients, friends and supporters in every country in the whole region. I saw on the chats and the participants, we have people from Guyana, from Costa Rica, from Guatemala, from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Barbados, San Lucia, many islands, uh, countries also in, in Central America. Uh, and I'm very grateful as well with the uh, company Dan Enterprises for pursuing and support BSM in Trinidad and also for sharing all the results of the some successful projects that he has done in, in, in Trinidad and that we use uh, in, the, in, the, in the presentation. So to all of you, uh, thank you very much. I wish you a good afternoon and please keep safe and, and, and be healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. And my own thanks to um, Ms. Ali and her team at the Marketing and Communications de Department. They're tremendously pressed, but they, they delivered a fantastic platform in terms of this program. I want to show all, all the attendees that there will be the, a, a recording of our presentations available. We have your email addresses, so we're going to be able to make sure we get that to you. We are going to try to answer all the questions that we were not able to answer as well. But here's the best thing. We are, this is just the first of many. As you can understand, um, the issues that we have raised here are cutting edge. It is great that um, we at the University of the West Indies have been and continue to work in um, research, in pavement design, in asphalt, and in um, bituminous materials that is cutting edge. And we would continue to ensure that we keep you as practitioners, as contractors, as designers, um, up to date with all the work we are doing. We are doing work in a number of other areas. We're working in RAP, we're working in um, the, the, the issue of aggregates, how to ensure that aggregates which may be considered marginal are not actually marginal. And we've done a lot of work in that regard and we've been partnering with industry in those regards. So thanks for everyone. Thank you for attending and for, for staying with us. It has been very informative. The number of questions has been overwhelming, but we are going to answer them as well as have additional um, seminars and webinars. And so stay tuned, stay tuned for what we'll be posting as well. I'm just going to ask the panelists if they could, um, um, I'm just going to ask the panelists to stay for just a brief moment afterwards and wish you all who have attended um, a very pleasant day. Um, continue success in your endeavors. I know that there are people from all over the world, including in the USA, Germany, and as well as you mentioned, the South American and, and Caribbean region. Thank you for having us, for being with us, and uh, do have a good day. Good day, everyone. Bye.